Okay, now, um, good afternoon everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you initially, when I can get these slides going, about public goods. There's a picture of a public good and an explanation of what a public, an informal explanation of what a public good is. Um, here is a formal explanation of what a public good is, and a public good is something which is non-rivalrous, so it's like this remote control, I've got it, you haven't got it, uh, and it's uh, as opposed to the speech I'm giving, which the people over here can hear, and so can the people over here. Uh, in addition, it's non a public good is non-excludable. And what that means is that you'll see, you can watch ships travel past that lighthouse. Every one of them can benefit from the lighthouse, so it becomes very difficult to charge for the lighthouse. And so that's, that explains why governments typically build public goods. Now, I'm going to tell you that that particular explanation which appears in, in an economics textbook is wrong. And I'm going to tell you that we've known that it was wrong since economics got founded by this fellow, Adam Smith. Adam Smith, we've all, we all know of Adam Smith as the author of The Wealth of Nations, but Adam Smith, another way of thinking about Adam Smith's project is to say that he was really, his, his, his fundamental intellectual question was what public goods, what, what are the public goods that are social preconditions for the market? Uh, I, I don't have time to go into what he wrote in the theory of moral sentiments, but perhaps, a, perhaps the most striking example I can give you is of a public good that uh, is, is perhaps the most important public good and it wasn't built by the government and it's not enforced by the government unless, of course, you're in France, in which case the government thinks that it enforces the language, but in fact it doesn't. So, uh, so we're in a world in which public goods always have been those built by governments and those which are emergent. Uh, just a quick diversion. Uh, there are some ideologues who go around and say, if only we could privatise this, if only we could privatise that, if only more things could be privatised, everything would work out. Well, Adam Smith had something to say about that, uh, which was, and, and, and in modern times, we have something to look at. We have, an exper we have experiments. Places where there are no public goods are called failed states. And what has happened, one way of understanding Web2 is that it is an explosion of public goods and none of them are built, are built by, the government, by the government. All of those, all of those um, Web2 platforms are public goods in the technical sense that I showed you in terms of that quadrant. So now we have a new kind of landscape to think about these public goods. On the one side, we've got the public goods from the economic textbook. And on the other side, we've got these emergent public goods, which someone like Adam Smith always knew uh, were at the heart of what makes, makes us such an incredible species. Linux, open source software, is, is basically built on the model of language. People running around, doing things for their own purposes, which gradually builds up an accumulation of things that are of benefit to the, whole, uh, to the whole species, or at least to the species that's speaking that particular language. And then we have a bunch of other goods, uh, that are public goods, that are built on platforms. And those are the platforms that I was talking about, like, uh, like Twitter, Facebook, and so on, any, any Web2 platform. And this is what so shows one of the big points I'm trying to make, which is that we're moving from a world in which we think of public goods as a problem into a world in which public, this capacity to build public goods is an incredible opportunity. I was on the way, walking to the Hyatt this morning, I thought to myself, what is the value of a Twitter hashtag, the, the, the concept of a Twitter, Twitter hashtag? Because the concept of a Twitter hashtag is a public good. 
um, well, maybe it's if you think about how it how much use it is in a, in a, in a, uh, a natural disaster, you know, how much good it's brought to the world in terms of uh, fighting political oppression. Perhaps it's 0.1% of GDP. If it is, that's $50 billion. Bang. Uh, once somebody came up with the idea, that's it, $50 billion. If it's only 1,000, uh, what, sorry, 1.01%, it's $5 billion. So that's the world that we're living in. And there's an important change that needs to be made there, and it's that. That it's not a, we, we don't have to worry about things, not, things being non-excludable because all of those builders of those platforms were building platforms that were excludable. You could be excluded from Google or Facebook and asked, to ch and asked for money to have access to them, but guess what? They wouldn't be anywhere near as socially valuable that way. They'd be worth ne nearly zero value, so much so that they're m worth more value to the private profit-seeking builders to leave them completely open and not to charge. So it's a remarkable world that we're in. And if we ask then, what, what about this space that, that exists between these two worlds, that's what I want to talk to you about today, or the rest of my talk is going to be about public-private partnerships, uh, a new way of thinking about public-private partnerships, which is really, again, about the ecology of these two, uh, the, the ecology of the public and private sector. But again, when we think of the private sector, it's more than just profit-seeking firms. Um, one example, we think, there's an example in, in a couple of pictures. The one on the right is a bridge that I travelled over a couple of weeks ago in Perth, and they needed a bicycle path. What did they do? They didn't build a new bridge for bicycles. They just hung a bicycle path off an existing bridge. We don't tend to do that with intangible economic, with, with the intangible economic infrastructure that governments have built. The tax system is such a system. In Australia, uh, we have built an income contingent loan, student loans off the tax system. That's been copied all around the world. Uh, so students going to universities get uh, a la get a loan, and then when their income rises above a certain level, it gets that they it, principal and interest is then deducted until the loan is paid off. We do exactly the same thing with alimony. There are uh, it, it works through the tax system rather than the ramshackle court system. Uh, and there are any number of other ways one could develop that. Uh, this is ABC Open. ABC, the ABC, like the BBC, is a national broadcaster. And uh, the, AB, uh, the ABC has just made all of its 53 regional stations multimedia hubs. If there's someone in Mildura, a country, uh, a city in one of our regions who wants to make a, a, a documentary about farmers and drought, they can ring up their local ABC and get assistance, learn how to do it, and then produce a public good, which, is then, which then goes on the platform. This is the National Library's uh, newspaper digitization site. We've digitized all our newspapers back to the beginning of the, the earliest newspapers we have. And as you can see, they're not easily digitized by computers. The computers make lots of mistakes. There's a mistake that I hope you can see in the digitization stream. And the way we've handled that is we've allowed volunteers, anyone who goes onto the site, can simply click on the line where the mistake is and fix the mistake. And the result has been that the site was never really launched uh, but it went 20, it's never been uh, inactive. Uh, it's always got people, right now it's got someone on it, some people on it, hundreds of people on it perhaps, correcting the text. Two, 20 million lines will, of text will have been corrected by October and uh, there's someone who's co corrected 2.5% of them. And don't try and match it with Julie Hemp and Style of Bendigo because she'll just work a bit harder. Some of you may know of Justin McMurray, who works uh, uh, as a volunteer. He's retired. He's, there he is working on the help desk. The surprise is that the help, help desk is for Verizon, an American multinational 
telecommunications company you will be familiar with. If he's prepared to do that for Verizon, what kinds of contributions can governments get with their, with their message, which is so much more compelling to citizens? Um, and uh, let me show you a, a, a company that I'm the chairman of, Kaggle, which launched only a little while ago. This is building a platform for global data competitions. Uh, some of you may have heard of the Netflix Prize. We post up data of a company or a government agency and we, there will be a task like you need to forecast sales or forecast revenue. Uh, people will compete for that prize from all over the world. That was a, the, we, we asked people to predict the HIV viral load of, uh, based on a set of data, the, the state of the art in the academic literature after 10 years was 70%. After a week and a half on the site, someone had it at 70.8%. And after, when the competition closed, the accuracy of the algorithm was up to 77 and a half, so 77%. That was with a $500 US prize. Those are some of the things that we can help governments do. Uh, they will have methods for forecasting these things. In a week and a half, we can work out whether your, whether your model is kind of okay or whether it can be blown away by some taxi driver in Belarus who can't get, his, get, him, get himself a job uh, in a data, data uh, analysis company even though he really knows what he's doing. Um, let's think about the state and private. It, 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 uh, giving to private entrepreneurs some of the facilities that the state has. There's right, my professor, uh, which you'll be familiar with. I put up Paul Krugman's page because I think you'd be familiar with, the, with why it is that Paul Krugman, a Nobel Prize winner uh, and a marvellous lecturer, uh, isn't rating all that well, and that's because it's a free-for-all in there. Uh, anyone can come on and claim to be anyone they like, and they can uh, then make comments and so on. Now, the state has the ability to provide a, a, an infrastructure for the integrity of ID, of, of uh, identification. One could build a back end to rate my professors through the universities and so on. And um, just to summarise what one might be able to do in the end, apart from improving the integrity, you might be able to ask the site not just who's the best professor, but what do students like me think is the best professor. So, so then you have a, a public-private partnership in which the state lends something that it has and the private sector contributes what it has to contribute. Finally, many people will be aware of Fix My Street, which started it all off um, uh, in many ways in the UK. If you notice a pothole on your way home from uh, work, you can go to, on to Fix My Street, say exactly where it is. There's a back end for local councils. Something like 20% of all maintenance calls go through Fix My Street now. How do we generalise that? How do we say uh, what kind of progress is made there? Because if we can generalise it, then we can say, let's apply something similar elsewhere. I think we can generalise it by analogy with utility reform. What do we do with utility reform? Take telephones. We said that Providing the network is quite a tricky business, but providing uh, the handset is something which the market can do perfectly well. So we, we let the government be the wholesaler. It can compete as a retailer, if you like, but, uh, but the regulation, the heavy government involvement, is, shrinks back into where there are economic problems. What, what uh, Fix My Street does, I think, is it generalises that. Utility reform opened space for for for-profit competition with essentially economic motives and uh, Government 2.0 can pull in energy from for-profit and not-for-profit endeavour with motives being economic, social and democratic. I'll flick through that. There, there's a, there's a for-profit version of the same, of, of Fix My Street and I was looking for a change that had been made to the Australian government, a cabinet reshuffle. I couldn't find it on the government site. I went to a volunteer site and there within an hour, not only were the cabinet changes up, but the minister's profiles had been updated. Lesson, 
is that if you let people do what they want to do, they might do a better job than, uh, than people who are, who are just turning up nine to five to do it. Uh, which is not to say, of course, that uh, that is always the case in government. So that is, uh, that's a summary of uh, all the things I've talked about. Thank you.